Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'll present to you in general first some security protocol verification techniques and then in particular the application of them to 5G authentication. But maybe to start first, let's talk a little bit about what are security protocols and how do they get designed. So you have a group of very smart people that sit together on a table and decide we need a new protocol for network security. So for example, here the IETF sits together, they discuss, they come up with a standard, for example, TLS, and this gets deployed, and the user uses this for online banking. The problem is some attackers, they're also smart, they find a problem. This problem gets published, the user is now not very sure if they're still safe. But of course, the good guys at the IETF, they fix it, there's a new version, everything should be fine. Well, there's another attack, and we can play this game for a little while, and uh, this is very unfortunate. The user doesn't really know what to think at the end. The problem here is that this is a very asymmetric fight. You might be thinking that, well, why can't these guys on the left not get it right? Well, because the attacker really only needs to find the weakest link. Um, the ad active adversary here can exploit the insecure network. There's a bunch of problems with concurrency in these protocols. We have to deal with backwards compatibility if we're uh, building on top of older protocols. So this is not an easy problem. This talk is about how can we help the good guys here. So what can our formal methods tools do for them? So what we have is a formal verification tool, Tamarin Prover, as you see down here in the corner. And we're applying this to find attacks against certain standards. So formal methods come to the rescue because they can find errors and attacks very early in the design process. But on the positive side, we can also establish formal security guarantees, at least with respect to the model we're working in. So it's not just, oh, we can use this to break it, but we can improve our own confidence in the protocol as well. To be able to do this, though, we must be very explicit about the system specification, the environment specification, the threat model in particular, and what are the actual goals we want to achieve with such a protocol. So formal verification in this symbolic model, also called the dolef yao model, works as follows. We first of all assume that the cryptographic primitives underneath are perfect. So we are not dealing with breaking the signing algorithm or the encryption algorithm. We're using those as building blocks. The security protocol itself is then encoded in a formal language with the syntax and semantics, and we model a network attacker, an active attacker that has full control on the, of the network, which is kind of the worst case scenario. This attacker can eavesdrop on all the messages, so everything that anyone sends out, the attacker learns, and the attacker can inject any message it desires and not only those it has seen, so it's not just forwarding messages, but it can rebuild new messages from knowledge it can deduce from the received messages. Again, the cryptographic primitive is assumed perfect, but say the attacker has managed to gain access to some key, that it can decrypt everything encrypted under that key and use what it learns to build new messages. We then encode security properties, either as reachability or as equivalence properties, and I want to say that this level of uh, modeling is really the sweet spot between on the one side being precise enough to capture large classes of attacks and on the other hand being automated enough that we can run these tools and get our results in reasonable time. Um, there's actually a number of different tools and I will only be talking about this one tool that we've developed, Tamarin Prover, but there's several other efficient procedures and tools. Uh, but note one important caveat here this basic problem is undecidable. So you cannot necessarily expect a catch-all solution. Now, maybe what's the difficulty? So first of all, we have to come up with a system specification. This answers the question, how does the system operate? But it also must answer the question, what environment are we in? Here, the problem is that often design documents are both incomplete and also imprecise. Particularly, the adversary model is often left unclear. We also, on the other side, here on the right, we have the security properties we want to verify. So what, what's our goal? What do we want to achieve with the protocol? Here, properties are often left implicit, also possibly imprecise. For example, we just say, oh, we want to authenticate. As we will see later in my talk, there's many different ways of authentication, different levels of authentication with respect to which partner. 
on what data? So those are all questions that we would have to answer. And then to link these two together, we have the system specification, and we want to check whether it satisfies the security properties, and we would like to give you a proof that it does. Here, the problem, of course, comes in the form of undecidability of the basic underlying problem, <coughs> and uh, this is restricted. Even when the cases are restricted, it can be fairly intractable, but as I'm going to show you, we've been able to analyze 5G AKA, the current or next generation uh, key agreement protocol for mobile communication, so the, the tools scale well enough and tracked us. So to give you a little bit of background, but this is really the only slide I'm going to do this on for how these protocol analysis techniques work in the example of the Tamarin Prover, we have two things as input. We have a system S that specifies what our overall system is supposed to do, and we have a property P that says what shall it achieve. We translate these two things into constraint systems, so we get both constraints for the system, and we negate the property. So we combine the system with the negated property, we run it through a dedicated constraint solver, and if we find a solution, that is, a solution says, I can satisfy all the constraints from my system and get the negation of the property, this means I have an attack. So in this case, the tool gives us such an attack trace, as you can see here on the slide, and we can then figure out what's going wrong and consider how we can fix this. The alternative is the tool can tell us that there is no solution. If there is no solution, this means we have actually proven that with respect to this specification of the system, the properties hold. Unfortunately, due to the undecidability, it can be that we run out of time or memory or simply patience. And, but in that case, there is hope. Our tool has an interactive mode in which you can look at the proof so far and uh, Consider, are there maybe some invariants that I know the protocol has? Well, I can encode those as hints to the tool, which can then take them into account, but will, of course, still prove overall that this is correct. All right. With that, I would first like to say thanks to all my collaborators on the Tamron team who have developed the tool Tamron, and then on what I'm calling here the 5G AKA team. No, we're not the developers of 5G AKA. We're the analyzers of this, and so with these groups of people, this is all joint work. 5G authentication. Why are we interested in this? Well, mobile communication is a big thing, as most of you know. Uh, there's 4.8 billion unique users in the world. About 60% of the world population has access to 4G networks. The next generation 5G is designed by the 3GPP, which has also designed 3G and 4G before, which is being deployed in two phases now, and the Current phase one has been frozen this year, and we expect commercial service by 2020. It uses an underlying authentication protocol, which uh, is the AKA, Authenticated Key Agreement Protocol, that has the main goal of achieving a secure channel and authentication between the mobile phone and the base station it's talking to. Over the years, there have been different versions of this AKA protocol. In 3G, it was just called AKA. In 4G, it was called EPS AKA. And now we have 5G AKA as the next standard. The question is, of course, oh, well, well, the statement is we want 5G AKA to improve security. But then we have to ask the question, well, what do you mean? Which security guarantees exactly? What is the threat model? And what are the security assumptions you make? So we want to formally analyze 5G AKA with our tool. So as you've seen earlier, we have a standardization body that has released a document. We take this and run it through the formal verification tool and sadly get some attacks, but also get proofs of all the things that we say there are no attacks on. So this is something to keep in mind that this is not a negative story. This is a fairly positive story that lots of things do work, but there are some minor things that can still be improved. And so uh, that's what this talk is going to focus on. So the process, of course, starts with this document. We read through 700 pages, split over four different documents. As I know, there's, there are many more documents, and it's part of a larger stack, and there's more problems there. But uh, taking that into account, we formalize this part of it. We get a fairly precise system specification that contains the architecture, that contains some assumptions and threat modeling we make, and of course, uh, the security goals. So here, the threat model was very much implicit and often unclear, similarly for the properties. 
We then take this more precise system specification and model it actually into a tool understandable system, S and property P, where part of the difficulty here is that this protocol has a very large and complex state space and the state machine itself is very intricate. We then encode our security properties not just under one threat model but under many threat models to figure out what's the strongest one under which it still is secure. We run this through the formal verifier and there's three possible outcomes, attacks, proofs and non-termination. We don't like non-termination, so we write proof strategies and provide additional hints, for example, invariants to the tool so that it can rerun. This is needed because many features do lead to non-termination, but in practice we've been able to solve all those for this protocol. Note that these proof strategies are sound by design, so they cannot change the tool to say, yes, yes, everything's fine when it's not. It still explores everything, but it does it in a smarter manner. Then for the problematic attacks we found, we also propose some fixes that we take back into our system specification and then remodel the system with the fix. And then we can show that the fix provably fixes the problem. So that's the overall security evaluation where we get some attacks and some proofs, but ultimately can, with the exception of privacy, fix all the problems. So to maybe give you a high level summary before I go into some more of the details, oops, before I go into some more of the details, um, we'll first have to extract and formalize the security assumptions, all the properties and the system specification from the standard. Then during that process, we identify a number of missing security properties that are not mentioned in the standard and also some flaws on stated goals. We have a large number of very fine-grained variants of all the properties for secrecy, for authentication, and for privacy. Our model is uh, the first faithful model of any of the AKA protocols because of the challenges that this protocol family poses. So in this family there are loops, the state machine is fairly large, there's an issue of scale in general, and it uses the exclusive OR operator which with which other tools have problems. Additionally, we have developed these dedicated proof strategies in our tool. And with this, this is a formal model of 5GAK that's actually amenable to automation and analysis. This then leads us to the security evaluation of 5GAK, where we do identify the minimal assumptions that we have to require for each of the security goals to hold. Sadly, for authentication, a number of critical properties are violated, but they can be fixed. For privacy, we can prove that it is preserved for a passive adversary, which it was not for 3G and 4G. Unfortunately, it's still broken for an active adversary. Secrecy for this holds, which is very good, but there's no forward secrecy. We do provide a number of explicit recommendations and provably secure fixes that in some cases even simplify the protocol. So. First, I will be talking a little bit about what's in the standard and how this 5G AKA protocol works so that we can then discuss uh, about the attacks and fixes in more detail. So basically, we have a phone that has a SIM card that wants to connect to an antenna and it does so billing your user's carrier. So in the speak of 5G AKA, we have a user equipment talking to a survey network and being connected to a home network of that user equipment. The protocol is actually designed to authenticate mutually the user equipment with the home network, the carrier, and it wants to establish a session key that the user equipment in the serving network can then use. To be able to do this, the user equipment is equipped with an identifier, the subscri subscription permanent identifier SUPI, and a symmetric key K. Both of those are, of course, shared with the home network. There's then a sequence number that is used for replay protection that is known to both. And additionally, the home network has a public-private key pair for which the user equipment knows the public key. The protocol then at a very high abstraction level works like this. The user equipment sends its identifier, SUPI, encrypted under the public key of the home network. Uh, this is good because previously the IMC that was the predecessor of SUPI was just sent in the clear, which is an immediate privacy problem. Based on this, in 5G AKA, the home network then computes a challenge using some extra randomness 
the shared key k and the sequence number. It also computes a session key and increments the sequence number and it sends the challenge and the session key to the serving network. The serving network only forwards the challenge and the user equipment then uses this challenge to first of all check whether it's an authentic and fresh challenge. If so, it sends back a success message including its expected response xres, which the home network validates and then sends the ide actual identifier supi and uh, just the statement yes success to the serving network. It's also possible that this authenticity or freshness check fails. In this case there's two options. If the freshness check fails, the user equipment will send back a synchronization failure. If the MAC, the message authentication code, fails, then the challenge is not, authentic, or not authentic and it will send back a failure that this is not authentic. This differentiation actually leads to some of the privacy problems later. Uh, note that I have abstracted this quite a bit and I have hidden a lot of detail which is of course part of our model but we will not look at that today together. So now with this precise system specification we would like to go into modeling and analyzing it. So our formal model contains about 500 lines of code. It includes the full state machine with the resynchronization mechanism. Uh, previous models usually omitted that. Uh, a precise modeling of exclusive OR and the sequence number counter. We also model the optional key confirmation to see whether it has impact on the security properties you can gain. We analyze all of this for an unbounded number of user equipments, serving networks and home networks, and an unbounded number of sessions. So the adversary can spin up as many copies of anything as he likes. The threat model and security properties are actually larger than the system. There's about a thousand lines of those. This is because we check 124 what we call lemmas. We check for 124 properties to see which of them are fulfilled and which of them are not. We also have a powerful Dolefiao network attacker, as mentioned earlier. And our security goals range all the way from secrecy over authentication to privacy. Why do we have 124 different lemmas? Well, because we consider many different compromise scenarios where, for example, you could lose your session key, you could lose your long-term key, you could lose the private key of the home network. So we combine all of these possibilities and figure out under which loss scenarios is it still secure. So this way we get the strongest possible adversary model with respect to which 5G aka still fulfills its goal. And then there's actually another about a thousand lines of code for the proof strategies that we had to write and then it takes roughly five hours of computation times to uh, verify it. This is because the complex state change leads to some loops and so the automatic method built into our tool oftentimes does just not terminate. A, a manual search is completely impractical because it's just too large but combining our lemmas and heuristics, we can guide the tool fairly quickly within five hours of computation time in the end to analyze all these properties. So now let's talk a little bit about the security evaluation, namely what goes right, the check marks, what goes wrong, the attacks, and then design fixes for those. Maybe first, is, is this really just binary? Do we just get a attack or or proof, well, it's a bit more complicated because um, we have many different copies of everything. So for authentication, we want to look at different perspectives. So we have the point of view of, say, the user equipment and its partner can either be the serving network or the home network. And then we get many sets of such properties. So essentially the question here is who obtains guarantees about whom? Secondly, there's many different kinds of agreement properties and this can be on different identities, on the data, uh, as replay protection. So there's a number of authentication properties and as you can guess from the size of the table now, there are different attacker models we want to look at. For example, what can be compromised? So there's at different points here we have attacks, at different points here we have proofs. And whenever we have a proof, this contains the minimal assumption we have to make. So for example, for the user equipment to agree with the home network, weekly, we have to have the minimal assumption that the long-term key K has not been compromised. Now on to some of the attacks. So the first attack we've shown is that uh, the adversary can make the serving network believe that it's talking to a different UE. So 
there's a mismatch between the subscription permanent identifiers they're seeing. This is possible because at the protocol level, the serving network receives the challenge and session key in one message and receives the identifier supi in another message and they're not bound together as the protocol specification describes it. So here there's the issue that an attacker could interleave two sessions and swap the two subscription permanent identifiers. Interestingly, in an earlier version of the draft, previously to 0.7.1, the subscription permanent identifier and the session key were sent in one message, so clearly they were bound together and this property was actually verified. As we are adjusting our models with, with each of the new releases of the draft, we found this flaw after one of the updates. The fix is either to make explicit that we assume a binding channel between the server network and the home network where such a reordering cannot happen, or simply cryptographically bind the messages together by sending them together, for example. Now, with that fix, we re-verify all the authentication properties, and we find that from the point of view of the user equipment, this time towards the serving network, we can get weak agreement as long as, well, key confirmation is done. The key confirmation step itself, though, is not mandatory in the standard. It's left open for subsequent procedures that may or may not do this. So the problem here then as an attack is that the, serv the attacker can impersonate any serving network towards the user equipment so long as key confirmation is not done because it's not mandatory. This is because the key is derived in such a way that it includes the secret. So the session key is included is derived using the long-term key K, the randomness, and more, but it does not necessarily include the serving network name. If it did, then everything would be fine. So the fix here is to either make key confirmation mandatory, which uh, then confirms that everything is okay, and we only need this in one direction, not actually in both directions as it's done in the standard. Addition alternatively, we can just add the serving network name to the message authentication code, which is sent by the home network. In this case, we can even completely skip the key confirmation step. And in this case, uh, our fix actually reduces the number of round trips that are required to get security. Regarding secrecy and privacy, we do get that both the session key and the long-term key are secret. We can prove that that holds. We do not get forward secrecy of the session key because all session keys are derived from this one long-term key K. So if ever in the future your long-term key K is compromised because somebody stole your SIM card and extracts the key, which is very difficult, but then they could uh, manage to decrypt all your old sessions if they had stored them. Regarding privacy, the good news here is that this improves massively over 4G in that the subscription permanent identifier actually remains secret. It is never revealed to the adversary. So this defeats the classical IMC catchers that are just waiting for each phone to broadcast their IMC. Unfortunately, it is not sufficient to ensure untraceability as long as there's an active attacker. So we found a problem there. The issue here is that there's no simple fix here. So um, it's based on the difference between sending a Mac failure and sending a synchronization failure if there's something wrong. And so you're very easily trackable. So the problem is that most likely there will be new 5G tracking devices coming in the future. On the other hand, privacy is a difficult problem anyway, and there's probably many more attack venues on privacy but still it would be nice to fix at least one of them. So to conclude at this point, we have looked at the 5G AKA standard. We see that it does lack explicit assumptions and security goals as it's written right now, so this is unfortunate. But on the positive side, we show and prove that it meets a, a large number of its core properties after some very minor easy fixes and additional assumptions that need to make be made explicit. Regarding privacy, it clearly improves over 3G and 4G, but it still suffers from the traceability attacks that I mentioned. And so we have an ongoing discussion with 3GPP and GSMA what can be done, and they told us they will modify the standard. We don't yet know in what extent and how quickly, so that's still open. Uh, at this point, I also want to say that there's some additional work by colleagues of ours from Oxford and Saarbrücken that had uh, also looked at a different level of this protocol that found related attacks, but different attacks as well. And so that should all be included together. Uh, this, that is actually being published at NDSS, which is upcoming shortly.
As future work, we would very much like to verify and compare to other variants of AKA. We've now looked at 5G AKA, but as I mentioned, there's a variant from 3G, a variant from 4G. There's also EAP AKA Prime, which is in 5G, and we would like to take a look at those and compare. Additionally, we plan to follow the development of 5G over the second phase to see if anything changes or any new problems are introduced or other or our fixes are included. Regarding privacy, we would like to have a more precise and efficient verification for it. So far, we can only falsify in the one case. Um, maybe most importantly to me, there would be the future work for others, namely that we realize that these formal methods are actually a very powerful tool and we think they are mature enough for real-world protocol analysis and it would be great if we could use them. So this leads me to my bonus slide which is that right now it worked like this. 3GPP releases a standard, we in academia read it, analyze it and report back attacks. This is not very efficient, this is after the fact. People have possibly already implemented some things. This is not the best way to do it. It would be ideally working like this where um, the protocol designers in their discussion sessions include the use of formal verification tools, which has, for example, happened in IETF's TLS 1.3 standardization, where they both used formal tools like Tamarin, but they also used cryptographers and cryptographic proofs during the design process before it was ever standardized. So that would be the ideal goal. And with this, uh, I would like to close my talk, and I'm happy to take your questions.